Hello, it's Parm King, and I am super excited about bringing you another guide to Curse's Draw. This one is St. Andrew's Church in Vallaki, and this is a pivotal location. It's a location that can change the course of the pi power dynamic within Vallaki and probably have ramifications beyond Vallaki. Um, I'm really excited to bring this one to you. But before we jump into it, I want to give out a special huge thank you to all my Patreon supporters. It's your support that continues to allow me to provide these video guides as well as the Foundry Adventure Modules. That's right, everything you see here, the maps, the lighting, the items, the actors, uh, all of it can be available to all my Patreon members. You can just download it, import it right into Foundry, and you have everything that you see here. I'm also putting PDF guides together as well. So if you're interested, there's a link down below to patreon.com forward slash King. And special recognition again to DM Andy, who's gracious enough to allow us to use his maps not only in our videos, but to provide them in our Foundry Adventure Modules. So huge thanks. It's another gorgeous map by DM Andy. He makes these maps also with grids, non-grids, light, day, night, special effects. Uh, you can go to his Patreon uh, page and download them there. I'll put a link down in the description below. So let's jump into this. But before I get into the map and the actors and the items and the quest, it's important for us to understand the political dynamic that's going on in Vallaki and Strahd's position in that political dynamic because this place could have a, uh, an event, a, a catalyst that will, will change the course of Vallaki and perhaps some impact your players uh, more so than you may think. So, Vallaki is ruled by the Burgermeister, and the Burgermeister's family has been ruling for several generations, and they're putting on these weekly festivals, these jamborees. They want everybody to be happy, and they're putting on these festivals because they believe that these festivals, keeping everybody happy, is what's keeping Lord Strahd and his evil minions away from Vallaki. Now, this is known, this is a fallacy known as correlation implies causation. In Latin, it's referred to as cum hoc ergo uh, prompter hoc, meaning uh, with this, therefore, because of this. It's a fallacy. It's like um, if my left shoe becomes untied, I notice that it rains outside. Therefore, if my left shoe is untied, it will rain. I mean, that's the same thought process that's going through the Burgermeister. We have these festivals, Oh, Strahd doesn't attack, therefore, to keep Strahd from attacking, we'll have more festivals. And he's done this so many times, it's being reinforced into the villagers of, Baro of, of Vallaki. The villagers are be believing this. The villagers hate the Burgermeister. They hate his henchman, Isaac. They do these festivals because, well, Strahd hasn't attacked, and therefore, they must. there must be something to it. This entire fallacy of correlation uh, implying causation has just been fed into the very uh, fabric of the Vallaki culture, except for Lady Valker. Now, Lady Valker is a minor noble. She's seeking power. She thinks the Burgermeister is an ass and his festivals are, well, <laughs> all they're doing is provoking Strahd. See, she thinks the proper way to rule Vallaki is to recognize that Strahd is the lord and master of all of Barovia. We should respect him. We should pay homage to him. In fact, her belief in Strahd goes to kind of a perverted devotion, almost, like almost this weird blind faith. And she's started her own kind of cult, and she's won some people to her side, but she doesn't have the power base yet to take power of Vallaki, right? She has a few cult members, She's fairly intelligent, she's fairly shrewd, but the Burgermeister still controls the town guard, he has Isaac, and he has the will of the people. Even though they don't like him, well, Strahd has an attack, so there must be something to these festivals. So where does Strahd fit in all this? Well, there's a couple of things that Strahd's looking at and he sees. First of all, Falaki isn't a threat. Right, I mean, he could go in there any day he wants to and just wipe the Burgermeister out and just clean house if he wants to. And he probably is amused, mildly amused with these silly, stupid festivals. And maybe it kind of pisses him off just a little bit, but it's nothing for him to worry about. See, Strahd's got bigger fish to fry. And remember, he is living in Ravenloft, this sad and tragic life. Remember, 
It's true. He is very powerful. He is a vampire, extreme amount of power, uh, evil, dark lord. He could probably lay waste to everybody. But he's also a tragic figure. He fell in love with Tatiana. She died centuries ago. He's been waiting for her soul to reborn. It's just been reborn with Irina. So he is just myopically focused and obsessed with Irina right now. He could give a shit about the Burgermeister and these stupid festivities. So there's a second thing that's going on with Strahd. See, Strahd is also the silly von Holtz. See, Strahd wants to live a different life. He doesn't want to be who he is. Remember, even in the book, it says he's looking for someone to replace him. He's tired. He's sad. He's lonely. It's, it's a shitty situation that he's in. And he takes these moments of escapism as Vili von Holtz, Vasily von Holtz, this person that he probably wishes he could be, this attractive young man who lives this kind of vivacious and, and uh, charismatic lifestyle, a, a gentleman, a renaissance man of Lockheed. Everybody loves Vasily. In fact, they say it's not a special affair if Vasily is not there. I mean, he probably dreams that this is what his life could have been if Tatiana just loved him. They could have been living this kind of dream romantic life. And so he goes to Vallaki to escape his miserable existence in Ravenloft. So he doesn't really want to destroy Vallaki at the same time. But he is starting to see what's happening here, right? The people are in, in Vallaki and perhaps in Barovia, you know, Strahd hasn't done anything to kind of flex his muscle, to reinforce his dominance. And Lady Vacher does have a point. I mean, you know, these festivals are kind of silly, and they're probably provoking Strahd, and he's starting to realize that. So Strahd puts a plan in place. He uh, disguises himself as a Vistani, and he visits the coffin maker. And he tells the coffin maker, look, I've got some bodies. I need some coffins made. I'll bring the bodies here. You can get the coffins made. And the, and the bodies are actually vampire spawn. Now, the coffin maker doesn't know this. He makes the coffin. The vampire spawn are in the coffin. And Strahd's plan is during the next festival in the town square, the vampires will come out and just wreak havoc. The, the town will realize these festivals don't work overthrow the Burgermeister, Lady Valker will come into power, and, and she's devoted to Strahd, and Strahd will again show his dominance over land for kind of, you know, these festivals and, and provoking him. So it's a perfect plan, and he can always maintain his Vasily persona when he wants to. So everything looks like it's going to fit okay, except for something else happens, and that's here at St. Andrel. In fact, it is St. Andrel's remain that change and set something into motion that's far bigger in scope than Strahd could have possibly wished for or imagined. See, this is what happens. This is Father Petrovich. He's up here, and he has this uh, altar boy. And here's the altar boy, Yeska. One day, they're standing up here, and Father... Uh, Lucian Petrovich tells Yeska, the altar boy, standing, we're standing right on top of the crypt. Right below us is a crypt of St. Andrew. And in that crypt, there is a skull of St. Andrew in this chest. And it is St. Andrew that protects the church and this ground. It's hollow ground. that Strahd and the darkness can never come here. We are protected. We have been protected for centuries because of this skull in here. Well, Yeska, being the orphan boy and being really excited and trying to, to please his friend, his only family, which is like a brother to him, who he lives with, which is the grave digger. This is Milavoy, the grave digger. And Milavoy was also an orphan. He's older now, and he sees Yeska as his, his younger brother, and Yeska is trying to impress him. He's like, hey, you know, Father Petrovich told me about this skull. It's buried underneath the, uh, underneath the church. Milavoy is thinking, no big deal. It's pretty cool. Whatever. Well, Milavoy, he goes to visit the coffin maker. He's the grave digger. He's got to find out how many coffins that he needs to dig graves for. And the cough, he tells the coffin maker, hey, you know, I heard this interesting story. There's about this skull 
buried underneath the church. And, you know, the coffin maker says, oh, cool, interesting. Well, the coffin maker decides to share this with that Vistani guy that told him, hey, I got these six bodies to, to put coffins to bury. And not realizing he's telling it to Strahd, Strahd realizes, aha, this must be the rain, remains of St. Andrew. Now, who is St. Andrew? Well, I put a little book together. There's an item here called The Story of St. Andrew. And I'll tell you the story. It's really brief. There's the skull of St. Andrew right there. And here it is. It's really brief. Andrew was a monk, and he was devoted to serving the morning lord. And centuries ago, he came to the village of Velaki and took residence in some old ruins and began holding services to the morning lord. And he invited any of the villagers to come and listen to him preach the, uh, the vestiges or whatever of the morning lord. And over a decade, this turns this into a sanctuary, welcoming anybody who wished to, to pray and serve the morning lord. Now, Strahd at this time has become a vampire. Again, this is centuries ago. And when he becomes a vampire at Ravenloft, his, some of his own guards turn on him and try to kill him when he's a vampire. And Strahd manages to capture a couple of the guards and kill them, and he questions some of the guards, and, and, he's, and they tell him the majority of the guards escaped. They went to Velaki, and they're staying at the sanctuary by this monk, Andrew. This monk, Andrew, has given him sanctuary. So Strahd goes to Velaki, and he confronts this monk, Andrew, and he attempts, Strahd attempts to charm Andrew, the monk. Now, he's trying to, to do this because he wants uh, to be invited into the ruins, into Andrew's home. Remember, he's a vampire. He just can't go into Andrew's home. These ruins are officially Andrew's home. They're also a sanctuary. They're a place of worship. And miraculously... No matter how hard Strahd tries, Andrew withstands every single attempt of being charmed. Andrew realizes that Strahd's a vampire. He's got these dark forces, these dark powers. And he realizes, as long as I don't invite him in and I don't go out, Strahd can't touch me. And so Andrew declares, so long as he stays here in any of these guards and anybody else seeking sanctuary from Strahd stays here on these grounds, Strahd can't touch us. So they live the remaining of their lives in this kind of commune fashion. He's got a pasture there. He's growing some food. And they have this commune, you know, in these old ruins. And eventually the land and the old ruins become hallowed ground following the death of this monk, Andrew. And becomes the home of the, his home and these ruins are built upon creating the church of St. Andrew. He becomes the saint, the patron saint of Vlaki. And Andrew's garden now serves as the church's graveyard. Now, Andrew's remains provide this hollow ground, this, this uh, sanctuary, this consecrated ground that, that Strahd can't touch. He can't go into the church. He can't go into the graveyard. Neither can any of his dark forces. And over the centuries, it's become something he just doesn't care about. Andrew's dead, whatever. You know, he's, he's worried about everything else. That's until the coffin maker tells him about this skull that the grave digger learned about. So as Vistani, Strahd says, as, as this Vistani to the coffin maker, I'll give you a hundred gold if you can get me that skull. Um, I want to use it for some Vistani rituals. So Henrik, the coffin maker, wanting some extra money, asks Milivoy, the grave digger, to give it to him and give him, split it, 50 gold if you give him the, the skull. And so Milivoy opens up the crypt, goes down below, uses a fish hook to open up the box, steal the skull, close the crypt, and brings the skull back to uh, the coffin maker. Now the Vistani, who is dry, tells the coffin maker, okay, I now need you to deliver these six coffins to the church before the Feast of St. Andrew. See, the Feast of St. Andrew is this annual holiday to their patron saint of Lockie, this one that's protected them from darkness. And so they have this, the food, there's this huge evening mass, and Strahd goes, this is perfect. I'm going to have my vampire spawn just unleash, just terror, just go on a feeding frenzy in this congregation on the evening of the Feast of St. Andrew. I mean, if you think the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones is bad, can you imagine like six vampire spawn just going on a feeding frenzy inside a congregation of his church? I mean, it's just going to be, it's just going to be massive 
bloodshed. And this begins, this whole story and all of this power struggle, it's what creates the mystery of the missing skull. So let's go ahead and review this mystery of the missing skull. Um, I have it as a journal note right here. So what happens is uh, when the players get to the church, Father uh, uh, Lucin Petrovich says, I need to speak to you guys, right? He goes, come, come into my, come into my, um, my private study. So the father goes down to his private study, which is right here. This is really, again, this beautiful map by, by Diamandi. We can see the, the fire, fire embers glowing right there. Check that out. Look at this gorgeous map. I can't help but to stare at it all the time. It's just so good looking. So he tells them, I've got a big problem. He tells them the secret. There's a skull that was underneath the church is what protects this church as hollowed ground, the, the skull of St. Andrew. Strahd cannot come here. Neither can any of the dark minions. Well, it's missing. And three days from today is the feast of St. Andrew. And I fear that Strahd and his minions will attack, and probably most likely on, on that day. He gives to them the book, which, which I just showed you earlier, so the players can read this story that I just told you, so they can learn about it. And they ask him, do you have any idea who might have stolen the skull? And he, who stole the skull, and he has no idea. He goes, I, I don't, but I have these clues to share with you. And here's, here's the, the first clue. Here he is. He's in the church. There he is. Here's the first clue, he says. First clue is a fish hook. I found a fish hook near the old lock. That it, was, it was used to pick open the lock of the chest that held St. Andrew's skull. Now, the father mentions there's Bluto, the, the fisherman who makes and sells fishing equipment. He might know who purchased this fish hook. The second is he mentions the stones were scratched. Someone used some kind of metal object to, to pry open uh, the stone covering the crypt there in the church. The next clue is there's some burlap twine. Bits of burlap twine was caught in the stone sealing the crypt. The same burlap used for the sacks sold by the wolf hunters. Perhaps... If you ask the wolf hunters, they might know who have purchased some burlap sacks. Then there's this parchment. He found this piece of paper that just, a little scrap, just says, before the feast. It's missing, but it just says other stuff. It just says before the feast. He does mention two interesting incidents. He goes, I've seen Isaac uh, standing outside the church. He's kind of watching this church, very strange, watching some people coming and going. He's up to something. And also that the Walker boys, uh, Nikolai and Carl, the two Walker kids, uh, he caught in the graveyard just recently sneaking about. So those are the clues the players have. Now, the players might ask, does anybody else know about the skull? And he'll say, share, well, it's common knowledge that the church is hallowed ground, protected by the remains of St. Andrew, But nobody actually knows about the skull buried in there in the father just forgets that he mentioned it in passing to the altar boy. He doesn't even be, think to even mention that because it's just a little altar boy and he mentioned it just, you know, after a sermon. So it's not something of significance to him or important to him. So he just doesn't mention it. Now, there are only a few people that the players, if they ask questions to, can give them any answers. So I put a list of them together. Anybody else they ask in Barovia, they won't know really anything about anything, you know, about the, you know, it's like, oh yeah, supposedly St. Andrew was this, you know, saint, you know, they're just ignorant. So here are the people that, that your players, because the father's given them clues, may ask. Now the first one is Bluto, and Bluto is going to be either located of one of two locations. He's either going to be at the lake shore of Lake Zarovich, or he's going to be in the Blackwater Tavern. That's the tavern a pub that I added in the streets of Vallaki. And he's the town fisherman. He's also this kind of drunkard, weirdo guy. And he will trade fish or gear, fishing gear, for wine. He will share the following information freely if he thinks someone's going to give him something to drink. So he says, well, yeah, I did trade some fishing, fish and fishing gear to Nikolai and Carl Walker for some wine. So that confirms that he did give them some fishing gear, possibly a fish hook. He also goes fishing sometimes with Milavoy. So those are the two things. You'll notice that Milavoy is mentioned in here again. Now, because there's another event at the Lake Zarovich, you can alternatively use this as the start of the rescue of Arabelle. Uh, 
uh, in Bluto at Lake Sarovich, and we'll be covering that in another uh, module, another another video. The second people he, that your players can question is Nikolai and Carl Walker. Now they're either going to be located in the Blue Water Inn, the Walker House, or in the Blackwater Tavern, which is that additional tavern that I added in the streets of Blocky. The two sons of Lady Walker are rude, they're arrogant, they're gonna to need to be persuaded or threatened or intimidated before they say anything. I'd run like a DC 10 check on this. And they have three things they will share. They traded some of that wine for, uh, for some fish and some fishing gear from Bluto, that's true, they do have some fish hooks. Um, Millivoy told them that there was a ghost in the graveyard and the reason they went to the graveyard is to see if there was actually a ghost of what Millivoy told them was true and when they got there Father Petrovich came out and scared him away and they don't go to church they don't know anything about a skull and they don't really care so you can just tell through their arrogance that they have no knowledge of this skull now, the next ones are the Wolf Hunters. And if they go to the Wolf Hunters, they're going to be either found in the Blue Water Inn, the Trapped Paw, which is the, the hunter's store and where they live, or at the Blackwater Tavern right across the street. Both those locations are on the streets of Blocky. And they will freely share information. They'll say, hey, the only recent sales we've had of burlap sacks have been to Bluto, the fisherman, because he buys them to, to put fish in, and Millivoy. Um, those are the only people that we sold any burlap sacks to recently. And they don't attend the service of the church. They don't know anything about a skull. They don't even know anything really about St. Andrew other than that's the name of the church. So they're pretty ignorant. You'll, the players will realize that they probably have nothing to do with this. The next person they'll ask is Isaac. Isaac will be located at either the Burgermeister's Manor, the Town Square, the Back Blackwater Tavern, or, well, of course, out in front of Blinsky's Toy Store because we know that little theme of Isaac and the dolls that he likes, Blinsky's toys. So those are one of the locations you can run into him. Now, he won't be willing to answer any questions. But if you persuade him or threaten him, DC 15, you can role play that how you want to. He's going to say, well, there have been some petty theft in, I think, he thinks, that's either Millivoy or the Walker boys. And so he's been keeping an eye on the Millivoy. And that's why he was standing outside the church. He wasn't watching who was coming in out of the church. He was watching Millivoy to see if you know, he's been up to no good. He doesn't attend the church. He doesn't care about Father Lucin or Petrovich. And he thinks the morning Lord stuff is just a bunch of hogwash and nonsense. Um, and he said, you should probably follow that Millivoy kid because he's always up to no good. So, you know, maybe Isaac's on to something. Now, the last two people that they'll question that will have information are important in when you ask them the question. So if they ask the altar boy first, any questions, they'll passively perceive that he's kind of afraid. And you want to role play this that he's afraid because he's just an orphan boy and he's afraid of authority figures, that he's not, not lying about anything. And he will, if asked, in front of Milivoy or in front of Father Petrovich, he'll say, well, I, 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 I did see Isaac out there. You know, he looks kind of suspicious. And, and the Walker boys were broken into the graveyard and got scared away. So he's not lying, but he's not going to say anything else. Now, if they get the Yeska alone, they can persuade him. Now, if they use a they roll a persuasion check of DC 10, he will share that the father told him the story about a skull in the crypt. But being a little kid, he doesn't really know what it is. He's like, there's some magic skull in the crypt. That's all I know. If they roll a DC 12 or higher, he will say, well, I told Millivoy about that. Right? Completely innocent. Now, if they question Millivoy, they're going to either find him in Millivoy's home, which is in the Streets of Milwaukee uh, map, or they're going to find him in the church, or they'll find him in the Blackwater Tavern. And if they question him before they question the others, he'll be reluctant to tell them anything. He's going to mention the whole Isaac thing. Yeah, he's been following me and giving me a hard time. And those Walker boys snuck in the graveyard. They wanted. They were asking me about ghosts. So I said, you know, I don't know anything about any ghosts. And so they were sneaking into the graveyard. They're, you know, trying to blame me. The players may determine that he's hiding something, but they won't be. He won't share anything else, even if they try to threaten anything. He's like, "Oh, I, I don't know anything." Now, if the players have visited at least two of these other people and questioned them and, and found out more about Millivoy, or if Yeska has given up the goods, Millivoy will be persuaded or intimidated. He realizes that he's been caught now. So, at a DC 10, whether it's an intimidation or persuasion, he's going to tell him this: "Look." I sold the skull to Henrik Vandervoot, the coffin maker. He offered me some money and he gave me a note to also help deliver six coffins to the church before the feast of 
St. Andrew, and I just need some money. I didn't mean any harm by it, and who cares about an old stupid skull anyway? So he doesn't see any big deal out of it. He doesn't really understand the whole skull, Andrew, Strahd thing. It's just, you know, they were going to pay him 50 gold to get him the, 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 the skull. This brings us to the conclusion of this mystery as your players are hunting around Velaki trying to solve this mystery, and that is the coffin maker. Now, if the players go to the coffin maker and ask about the skull, but they haven't learned anything from Millivoy, they haven't learned that Millivoy has admitted selling the skull to, to Henrik. Henrik says he doesn't know anything, and a perception check of DC 12, the players will know he's withholding something, but he's just not willing to tell them. If they try to threaten him or everything, he just gets too scared. He just clams up. He locks himself in. He says, just go away. I don't know anything. Leave me alone. Now, if the players confront him after learning from Melavoy that Henrik purchased a skull from him, Henrik will offer no resistance. They'll just, he'll tell them flat out this story. One night, several months ago, a Vistani visited me with some business. The Vistani had some bodies. He needed coffins for a proper burial. He delivered six bodies. I made six coffins. I carefully moved the bodies in the coffin. I did feel some darkness and some evil. I, I chalked it up and thought it was some Vistani curse or something. I didn't want to ask any questions. I closed the coffin. I left them in the room upstairs. Then Melvoy told me about the skull he heard about at the St. Andrew's Church, and I just happened to share it with this Vistani. The Vistani was really interested in it and said, I'm here, here's 100 gold pieces. Get me this skull. I want to use it for some Vistani ritual. And he asks, uh, uh, he offers Melavoy to go get it. And he says, well, after he acquires the skull, if he could have these coffins delivered as quickly as possible to the church before St. Andrew's feast. And it would seem logical. Maybe he wants them buried for this big festival there. And he offered uh, the coffin maker another whole uh, 100 gold pieces to take these coffins now to the church before St. Andrew's feast. The, the Vistani never came by for the skull, and Milvoy still needs to help uh, Vandervoot, the coffin maker, carry these six coffins to the church. Now, he'll tell him the coffins are upstairs, locked in the room up, upstairs. If you go to the left, if you go to the right, in my bedroom, in my wardrobe, is the skull. Um, and so he'll turn that over readily. Now, the players are going to not know that there's vampire spawn in these coffins. The coffin maker doesn't know they're, Vander, they're, they're vampire spawn. He just thinks... There's this Vistani. Maybe they have some Vistani curses on them. So when the players go up there, they're gonna have they're gonna be in for a shock. There's gonna be some vampire spawn up there. They're gonna have to deal with six vampire spawn and fight them off. Um, they're also gonna find the skull that's in his wardrobe. Now the players must return the skull of Saint Andrew to the father and get it in the crypt before this feast of Saint Andrew to avoid this vampire attack. Now. If the players fail this, right? If the players fail, the players did not find the bones and they don't get them to the crypt in time, Milvoy and Henrik will have already delivered the coffins to the church. And you can see that here on the map. I'm just gonna bring up the map really quickly so you can take a look. So if we go right here outside, you can see, I'll just bring Jeska back inside, put him over here. You can see out here, we got one, two, three, four, five, and there's another one here. So they've delivered the coffins out here. And, and this is where they are. The six vampire spawn are in these coffins, ready to, to come out. Now, they'll deliver them, and during the evening of the Feast of St. Andrew, four swarms of bats will fly in through the belfry. They'll come in right through here. Here's the belfry right here. They'll come in through the belfry, and they will swoop in to the church, and they will snuff out all the candles. All these candles will go out, and the church will be just flooded, sending the church into darkness. And these bats, these four swarms of bats, will begin terrorizing the congregation, attacking the congregation, right? Now, Father, Father you know, uh, Petrovich is going to try to keep everybody calmed down. Now, then what's going to happen is there are four exits to the church. And the vampire spawn, let's just get him out here just for, for shits and giggles. This, this vampire spawn, look at this. Tell me he does not look totally mean here. The vampire spawn, there's six of them. There's going to have one vampire spawn at this exit here. He's going to come in. We got one vampire spawn at this exit over here. It's in the graveyard. He's going to come in. You've got another vampire spawn at this exit over here. It's going to show up. So you're going to have three vampire spawns at the head of the church. They're not going to let 
any of the congregation out that way. Where's the other three vampire spawn? Well, they're going to be down at the main entrance. And they're just going to be coming in, and they're just going to be ready for a massive feeding frenzy. They're just going to come in here and just start going to town on the congregation. Now, uh, Father, what's, what's going to happen is Father Petrovich is going to try to lead the congregation out the um, eastern door over here. He's going to take on, and, and he's a priest, so he has, you know, he has a couple of, he has a mace, he has some spells. Uh, he's going he's gonna to try to take on this vampire spawn and lead his congregation out through the east. Now, if the players are anywhere in Velaki when this shit goes down, anywhere in town, they're going to hear a commotion about some horrific stuff happening right now at the church. Villagers are going to be running away from the church. And if the players come and arrive at the church down here, they're going to run into these vampire spawns down at the bottom, just going to munch town on the congregation, right? And so there's only going to be a couple outcomes if they haven't returned the bones. If they fight off the vampire spawn and win, they get rid of the bats, they've killed off the six vampire spawn, Father Donovich, Father Petrovich survives, every night swarms of bats and vampire spawn will arrive at the church and just keep on attacking the church. And there's nothing that Father Father Petrovich, Lucian Petrovich can do until those bones are returned. So he's going to be holding down the fort the best he can. Now, eventually he's just going to be overwhelmed and he's going to be killed. Um, if Father Petrovich dies, the, the town folk are going to bury him and they're going to certainly rise up against the Burgermeister and Lady Falker will assume power of Velaki. So getting these bones, the skull, back into the church, into the crypt up here at the top uh, in here is priority because if they don't, um, the vampire spawner can keep on coming back. Father Petrovich is dead there, and the town is going to switch power very quickly to Lady Valker. Burgermeister will most likely be killed or thrown into prison. Isaac will go on the run, and everybody is going to be suaded to become uh, support Strahd. I mean, that's what Lady Valker says. You're going to have to pay, praise Strahd. He's our Lord Master. He, what did I tell you? The Burgermeister in these festivals, all you did was just piss him off. The vampire spawns came here and killed a bunch of people. In order to have peace with Strahd, we also we have to pay homage and recognize that he's our Lord and Master. That's what she's going to tell him, and that's what we're going to do. And that unfortunately means that your players are going to have a very difficult time in Velaki going forward. I mean, people are going to have to shut down, be very quiet. Nobody's, you know, it's going to turn into that neighbor spying on neighbor. You know, did you see anything bad about Strahd? We don't want to be attacked. So you're going to really turn into this this kind of paranoia city and and anybody that was helping the players will probably be less likely and willing to help players if the players are coming across as anybody uh, that are antagonist towards Strahd, that are provoking Strahd. So nobody wants to get, you know, in Strahd's crosshairs. So this this definitely this event will definitely shift the course, the power balance, not only in Velaki, but could hinder the players significantly if, they, if the players are trying to work with the with the Mardikovs, the Blue Water Inn, the Keepers of the Feather. Uh, they could just shut down and say, hey, look, we just don't want any trouble right now. You know, um, stay off the radar. Maybe Yarovich is not willing. You know, a lot of people might not be willing to share information or help the players or even sell weapons. Maybe the, 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 the blacksmith won't sell weapons to them anymore. I mean... Everybody is now going to be living in, in fear. And Lady Valker and her cult people are going to be spies everywhere, and she's going to be ruling this. So it's pivotal to get these bones back uh, and defeat Strahd. Not that you necessarily want the Burgermeisters to stay in power, you know, and you want Lady Valker to come in control or, may, or whatever, but this will definitely shift the balance of power and, and certainly create problems for the players. So this is a pivotal quest here and I've, I've outlined it all now this quest i've put this together you can see there's a link down here to um D, &D beyond so if you do have D, D beyond you can read about it i made some changes to this from rules as written obviously um and then we have dragon card as lessons from feast of saint andrew a link to that as well as mandy mods church of saint andrew and hallowed ground mandy mod and dragon carta are two of the most uh pivotal people writing um, mods and and uh, variations and new content for Curse of Strahd. And a lot of these ideas came both from 
Mandy Mod and Dragon Card, and I've kind of infused them together. So that's the main quest. There is a secondary quest that I put in here, and this is kind of a fun one. Again, by the way, we have all of these. I put them all in here. We've got um, just a couple little notes. I put the nobles, the nobles, uh, Velakis get to sit in the front row. Velaki villagers get to sit in the third row and the last row. Um, we also over here on one of these seats on the side is where you're gonna have your altar boy over here. Um, we do have this room, a burial room here. If you wanna use that for some side thing, we have uh, your own quest or whatever. We have um, Father um, uh, Petrovich's study. This is where you're gonna have that book here. Here's the book of St. Andrew. He'll give the, them this book of St. Andrew, which will be in his study here. So that's available in the study. Here's actually the skull. Um, if they find the skull, there's an item here um, to give to the players for them to bring back. This is um, obviously Father Petrovich's room. And this is a room. There's rescuing um, Stella Walker, which we'll cover in that, in that module separately. Um, he will provide her refuge here, this, the, uh, her room. Now, here's the, let me just delete these vampire spawns for a second. Here's the next quest. quest. So when the players come into the church here, they're going to see this lady here. Now, she's actually, there's just a brief sentence mentioned in Curse of Strahd here. She is the mother of the shoemaker. I call them the Schumacher. You know, it's German for shoemaker, and it's also a tribute to Michael Schumacher, a great Formula One race car driver. So when entering the church, there's going to be this woman. She's over here praying, and she's sobbing. And if the players ask her if she's all right, she's going to introduce herself as uh, Miss uh, Rikalova. And her son, the shoemaker, or Schumacher, has been in prison for speaking out against the Burgermeister. If the players offer offer to help her, she's going to share with them these things. Number one, her son was the shoemaker, uh, uh, Udo. Her son had stopped attending the uh, services of the morning lord. He's been going out late at night, dressed in dark robes and attending some meetings, but would not tell her about it. Every time she asks him where he was going, he would get mad and tell her that she would not understand. He has an exceedingly high opinion of Lady Valker, and it was Lady Valker who told him that the Morning Lord stuff is nonsense. He was arrested at the Wolf's Head Jamboree, another one of Burgermeister's festivals, for carrying a sign that suggested the villagers feed the Burgermeister to the wolves, but it was a joke. She believes it was Lady Valker who had told her son to carry the sign and provoke the Burgermeister. If they rescue her son, she will pay them 200 gold. Now, her son's being held in the closet, in the house of the Burgermeister. Now, what do we know? Well, Udo is actually Joan Lady Valker's cult. While Lady Valker did not exactly tell Udo to go create this sign to provoke the Burgermeister, she didn't bother to stop him either. Uh, Udo is a brainwashed, as are all the other cult members, into hating the Burgermeister and wanting him removed. He's also brainwashed to not to respond anything about the call and doesn't know anything. So if he's called, he just doesn't know anything if he's questioned. He's been programmed to just put on these robes and to go to this meeting once a week in the basement of Lady Valker's house. So he is one of the cult members. Now, if the players pay Lady Valker a visit, she'll mention she does know him, but she doesn't know anything more. She doesn't know certainly anything about a cult, and she sure, certainly will not tell Odo to, pr to provoke the Burgermeister openly. And if they see if she, you know, see if she was lying, she's not lying. She didn't tell him to do it. He did it on his own. Obviously, the cult influenced him, um, so she is telling the truth. But she will also find it humorous and even enjoy it that he did it. And if asked about the cult, she'll know nothing. Now, Udo's being held in manacles in the closet of the Baron, Baron's, the Burgermeister's manor, and. Actually, the Baron's not as mad about holding up the sign. He's trying to learn about this cult. He knows this cult exists. He knows that there's people moving against him. And he is trying to get information out of uh, Udo. But Udo has been brainwashed. He, doesn't, he won't be able to share any information. So the Baron's getting very frustrated because his, all his leads have yielded nothing as these cult members are, are brainwashed into forgetting. And he was trying to find out who the leader of this cult is. He does not know. So this whole small quest, which is only a couple lines in the uh, in Curse of Strahd, kind of helped lead you to Lady Valker, lead you to the cult, and put all of this this together. So those are the the two the two quests 
uh, in here, the big one, the missing skull of St. Andrew, all the, the different people and locations, um, also the side quest for the rescue of the Schumacher, and then you know how to, how to play out this entire, entire battle here. You may hear in the background, I've been playing it, I'll just turn it up briefly, is I have some of the church sermon going on. I'll just turn it up a little bit. My sins have been bound into a yoke. By his hands they were woven together. They have been hung on my neck, and the Lord has sapped my strength. He has given me into the hands of those I cannot withstand. So anyway, that is, that's it for St. Andrew's scene, this gorgeous map. We have a graveyard here. All the walling and lighting has already been done. I put the lights and the walls in here. You can just see that. I'll show you all the lights and the walls there. So if you have Foundry, you can go ahead and just import this right away. It also comes with the items and the journal entries. I'll also make this available in PDF as well. Hey, thanks for watching. Please click like and subscribe. It really helps get my video out there. And until next time, may all your roles be critically successful.